Welcome to Paranormal, Episode 6. This time we're going to be talking about sleep paralysis. And as we jump in, we have most of our uh, co-hosts with us together. Uh, we have Trey Strickland and Doug Overmeyer is with us. Brian Gadawa has graced us with his presence. <laughs> Doug Van Dorn <laughs> and, of course, Natalina. Um, so welcome back, everybody. Just chime hey. in here. Hey. hey! Merry Christmas! Yeah, Merry, yeah, <laughs> Merry Christmas! There we go. Uh, I, that's sort of an inside joke because Natalina, why don't you tell everybody sort of what you're dealing with today? Well, we have had about two feet of snow in the past 48 hours, and I'm just barely here on the show by the skin of my teeth because I've been trapped in a pile of snow for several hours. So it is beginning to look a lot like Christmas over here in North Dakota. Yeah, which is real, by the way. It is a real, it's a real, it's not a militarized zone. <laughs> and your teeth aren't chattering, so you're in good shape. Yes. <laughs> All right, well, sleep paralysis, we, we decided to uh, take a look at four articles, and I'm just going to mention those for listeners. Uh, the first one, these, this is going to be in no, no particular order. They range from 1999 all the way up to uh, 2015. But one is titled, The Identification of the Transmitter and Receptor Mechanisms Responsible for REM, R-E-M, Sleep Paralysis. And that's from the Journal of Neuroscience. And the authors are Brooks and Peaver. Then we have two uh, authored by, I, I'm not sure how you pronounce this last name. It's C-H-E-Y-N-E, -E, maybe Shane. Uh, or Cheney, I, I guess you could you could see either of those, and then one of those two has a few co-authors, Roy Fur and uh, Newby Clark. But the one of the articles is entitled "Hypnagogic and Hypnopompic Hallucinations During Sleep Paralysis: Colon Neurological and Cultural Construction of the Nightmare." Uh, of course, that refers to brain function, uh, regions of the brain, whatnot, and the second article by, uh, we'll just go with Shane here, is entitled Situational Factors Affecting Sleep Paralysis and Associated Hallucinations, colon, Position and Timing Effects. Now, those two articles, again, authored primarily by the same person, there's going to be a lot of overlap there. The second one that I just mentioned, Position and Timing Effects, really deals with the body position and like the time of night uh, when sleep paralysis typically uh, occurs. And then lastly, we had an article by Ann Cox entitled Sleep Paralysis and Folklore. <clears throat> that was from the jo Journal of the Royal Society of Medicine, the, an open journal that is freely accessible on the web. And I should, should mention the two Shane articles. One was from the journal Consciousness and Cognition, and the other was the Journal of Sleep Research. So we have four different journals different aspects of sleep paralysis. And I think it's it's probably good to start off uh, this discussion by asking all of you, and then I'll go last, uh, have any of you ever had sleep paralysis? Can you tell us about it? I have. Um, I was thinking about this in leading up to the show because um, initially I was going to say that although I've experienced sleep paralysis, I've never experienced the really kind of scary things that usually come along with it. I, I just could recall, you know, waking up and being unable to move, but be seemingly fully aware. And that in and of itself is a scary sensation. Um, but as I was thinking about this, I recalled that when I was quite a bit younger, I did have this series of um, instances where I had waken up I woke up in the night and I couldn't move. And I, I remember I thought people were screaming at me loudly, screaming directly into my ears. And I was so scared and I couldn't move. And I also was trying to like, I was very young. So I still, you know, lived at home and I was trying to scream for my parents and I couldn't actually make any words come out. And, um, so that 
heightened the scariness. And I remember my eyes kind of darting around the room trying to figure out who was screaming at me. And this happened to me a number of times, but I had kind of <laughs> forgotten about that. But I, I think that would qualify as a sleep paralysis and auditory um, hallucinations or whatever they were. But I've never experienced like the full, you know, seeing things and, and, you know, feeling the crushing pressure on my chest or anything like that. But I've experienced it kind of on that, on that level when I was younger, more of an auditory thing and just the paralyzing uh, fear along with the actual bodily paralysis. It hasn't been something that's been an ongoing issue for me, just kind of some isolated instances. This is Brian Goodell, um, to add um, to that from my own experiences. Um, yeah, I found this very fascinating because of the fact that it sort of explains a lot of the things that I have experienced as well over the years. And I guess we'll be talking about the several different major categories that they fall into. But the one that I've experienced most was the intruder version, which is this notion that uh, fear you're being watched, maybe an evil presence or at least a hostile presence, that kind of a thing. And I definitely have experienced that over the years. Um, but mostly in more recent times, it it always ends up with me. I'm, a, I'm in the supine position and I am looking up at the smoke alarm in my in my bedroom that has a little teeny green light and I, and I go and it's so funny cuz like every time I go through the same process of like who is that watching me is that a government worker is that an alien is that a demon is that a you know <laughs> and and I go through the process every time and I and you know it's very confusing until you I finally sort of become more woke and, and I realize oh it's a smoke alarm again why do i always keep thinking it's someone watching me type of thing it's kind of amusing in some ways but yeah so that's been my mostly what my experience has been and that's like once every i don't know maybe 4 months or 5 months or something like that wow that that's pretty frequent i mean it must be the stuff you write uh, that's <laughs> That's what I was thinking too. That totally explains your books, man. <laughs> but you know, and that's more than a joke because I do believe that that might actually have some effect. You know, because if you're if you're trafficking in uh, thought patterns that deal with, um, you know, whether it's uh, the demonic um, or just scary things, uh, I do believe that that can put your mind in that category of thinking, you know, you can become a little bit more paranoid. Yep. I'm the kind of person who walks down the street and I'm thinking of movies I've seen when I see people do things, you know, and I'm like, honey, don't do this because I saw this in a movie, you know. And uh, so it kind of does consciously come into my world. And I actually do think that that may be some of it, you know. Yeah, I, when I walk down the street, I'm thinking about either my wife or my pug. So it's just, <laughs> I haven't seen either of them in movies. <laughs> well, I mean, like, you know, like we go, we, I live in a condo, so we go down to the garage and it's sort of like, watch yourself, look around, make sure there's no one in the garage to, who might attack you because, and of course, LA, in LA, it's not an, un, it's not a, an unrealistic sure. thing. We actually did have people steal cars and break, violent people break into our cars in the basement. So it's not unrealistic, but I definitely... I think more about those things, and so it doesn't. It wouldn't surprise me that they it comes up more frequently in my dreams or whatever. How about either of the Dugs? So what Brian just said is interesting to me because um, this, this is a DVD. Because uh, first of all, I mean, I I tend to think that I think about some pretty weird things, and Brian's kind of my hero, so I've been watching more horror movies lately. <laughs> those kinds of things. Um, but I actually. I mean, I, I, I might be able to remember one or two instances, sort of like Natalina, where I've had a, I couldn't move. I wake up and I can't move, but I've had, I've had nothing of what's, what Brian described. Um, I haven't, I haven't heard anything. There's been nothing but that seems supernatural or strange. It's just like, I just couldn't move, which like she said, it's terrifying, but there's nothing more to it. So it, it's curious that Brian would, would make that comment. And then I'm, I'm kind of making the opposite, I guess. I don't know. Mm. Yeah, this is Dio. I've never experienced any of these uh, situations. Wow, well, that's interesting. This yeah. is Trey. I have I've, a handful of time, and uh, it is pretty scary. I remember everything and just fighting, trying to make my muscles move. It, it hasn't happened in about 20 years, but I have had a handful of experiences 
only one that felt demonic in a sense that uh, I was sleeping, I was on vacation, and I woke up, I was paralyzed, and I felt like something was trying to kill me, and it felt like uh, my conscious was kind of fading out. So it was like getting blacker and blacker and blacker and blacker. And as it got blacker, I fought more and more and more just to get my hands to move. And finally, sure enough, I was. And that's the only time that it was actually ever, ever scary in a dark sense. Uh, the other handful of times is just I woke up, I couldn't move. And it was just, it took everything in my brain to just move your hand, move your hand, move your hand and try to fight it. And it's the most weird sensation to be awake and not be able to move anything into. It literally took everything brain power I had to move my hand and uh mm. That wasn't as scary as much as that one time. And I've only had one episode that it, it felt scary in nature. And, uh, you know, I have no idea what that means or what it is. But I have experienced it, and uh, it's not fun sometimes. Yeah, I, I, I can remember this. Uh, I can remember having this experience two times. And um, I, I, I it's, it's probably happened, you know, more than two times. But... That I distinctly remember, and it hasn't happened for, in my case, you know, over 10 years. Um, but I could tell you where I was both times, you know, the, the, the situations and whatnot. Once was in college where I was not uh, lying on my back. So according to the literature, this is a little unusual. Um, I was uh, face down, but it, it's the classic, you know, you, you're awake, you know you're awake, and you can't move. You know, you I mean you're just totally paralyzed. And in the in the one instance, the one when I was in college, that which would have been the first one, at least that I recall uh, distinctly, um, there I did have the sensation of something being on top of me. So you have this pressure, but you know, I I just I don't know why because I can't re remember ever doing any reading about it or, or anything like that. But I just sort of knew, okay, there's just something going on here that. You know, I didn't think it was sinister. I didn't think it was supernatural, even though it was kind of freaky. Uh, I just thought, well, I just need to go back to sleep, and that'll be that. And and basically, that's what I did. But but it, it was very real. You know, the, the pressure was real. The immobility was real. But I was completely awake. I'm looking at the wall, you know, on on the, on the side of the bed, and I'm looking around. And I mean, I I'm fully conscious, but I can't move. So it was it was very strange, and the second one was a little a little more frightening. Uh, I had the sensation of you know being choked, you know, like something wrapping around your neck, and you could sort of feel it moving uh, around your neck. But I again, I kind of knew what was going on, like I had the memory of the other one, and so you know I I didn't like you know freak out at, you know too much, but it was it was really uncomfortable. That's the way I would describe it. Now I've had one of my kids, and I know I'm not going to get any more specific than that. Have what probably I, I'm I'm not quite sure. After reading the the articles, it, it probably does fit into the sleep paralysis category. But um, there was the paralysis, the immobility, and you know my my kid. Um, told me that they uh, not only felt a presence in the room, but thought that they saw like a shadowy, you know, kind of presence and also had this sensation of floating. Uh, and that comes up in the journal articles as well. Now, I've never had that. But again, there was an example where somebody I, I know lives in my own house, you know, has had this happen. And, and it, that's, that has occurred two times, uh, kind of not not real close together but um it hasn't happened for a number of years so i have that experience as well you know having you know one of your children you know report this to you and you know having to you know, trying to, to talk to them about it and so that they're not um you know too alarmed by it uh you know because i i i'm not willing to completely exclude um you know, the, the supernatural from these things. I mean, we did have people, you know, you know, pray about the situation and, and, and whatnot, you know, prayers of protection and, and so on and so forth. And uh, we, we let, you know, my, my child know that, that we were doing that. And so that I think, you know, seemed to help. Now, 
you know, I, I don't know that that there's a connection, a necessary connection. And I'm I'm being pretty deliberate with my wording here. I don't know that there's a necessary connection. In fact, I I, I would sort of uh, be skeptical of a necessary connection between sleep paralysis and 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 supernatural activity. Although I think there could be overlap. Uh, that that's sort of the way I I think about it. But why don't we, for the for the sake of the listeners, I think they might also find it interesting at how our our articles defined sleep paralysis because you get a bit of a a range here. Now the one on folklore, you're going to get a folklore definition. So in the summary, uh, Ann Cox writes, sleep paralysis is a relatively new term to describe what for hundreds of years many believed to be a visitation by a malevolent creature which attacked its victims as they slept. Again, that's a very, you know, folklorish, you know, kind of definition. Uh, something that's more clinical, one of the Shane articles, sleep paralysis is a transient conscious state of involuntary immobility occurring immediately prior to falling asleep or upon awakening and is classified as a parasomnia associated with REM, rapid eye movement. Uh, the other you know, the other articles are going to have something like that. Again, very clinical. And this one hints at the connection clinically with rapid eye movement, that, you know, that uh, stage of sleep. So I'm just going to throw it out here and ask um, two questions of, of all of you. Uh, what, what did you find, again, interesting, stimulating, uh, questionable, whatever adjective you'd, you'd put on it, about the research? And also, what do you think – do you think there's any relationship at all uh, between sleep paralysis and, you know, a, a supernatural, you know, demonic, sinister presence? Mm. Well, I was thinking about this as I was reading the articles, and <clears throat> they they seem to all kind of share the common thing that this is a physiological response it's that you know there's not a whole lot of analysis on whether there might be a supernatural component so um they kind of all seem to agree on that and it's it's very convincing i found it very convincing um in the various articles that there's probably most most of these instances have to do with it disrupted sleep patterns and stuff like that um I kind of came away from it because I did a show a number of years ago about the um, phenomenon of spectrophilia, which mm -hmm. is really closely linked to sleep paralysis. And it's kind of more getting into like the incubus succubus thing. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of people experience it a lot of, for a lot of people, it goes so much farther beyond just that sensation of a presence or, or, pressure you know they they experience that there's literally a person there and and having an encounter with them so I kind of came away from this with my supernatural worldview very much intact but convinced that sleep paralysis is a thing that is probably largely you know natural but that perhaps you know a um say a demonic presence could exploit that vulnerable state um, or mi mimic it. Um, but, you know, that would probably just be anecdotal and maybe not any way to prove it. Um, but it, it, the articles were very convincing to me that a whole range of things from auditory hallucinations, like what I experienced, thinking that someone was screaming at me, um, to actually seeing a presence, that that all can be pretty well explained by what's happening in the brain and in, in, in those instances. So I don't see any reason to discount that it's a natural thing that happens to a lot of people, but that perhaps there could still be this supernatural component where of, of more just like 
exploitation because how how much more vulnerable can a person be if their body is literally paralyzed and yet they're fully conscious you know so that's kind of where i was at with it anybody else I'll follow okay. Nat again. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Gadawa. Yeah, I, I had the same reaction, the same response. I've never really th considered it my experiences to be um, to be supernatural. I know I go through the process where I think they are because you're you're waking up and you're you're not fully, uh, you know, cognizant and of your senses and your intelligence and all that. Um, but by the end, I, I realized they are. And I've seen shadows as well. I've seen shadow figures looking at me. But as I continue to look at them over time, they end up being, oh, that's the pillow in the corner, you know, or that's literally the, the something standing up, you know, that, that's already there. So as I, as I read this, you know, this is another one of those cases. You read these descriptions, um, and they're mostly neuroscience and, and materialist explanations, like Matt was saying. And I, too, also... Had I had to come to the conclusion that though I resent, though I have a particular animosity towards materialism because of its reductionist factors, and you see this in some of these articles where there's a tendency to reduce uh, reality to the chemicals and the neuroscience that's going on in your brain with an, a complete ignorance of the fact that describing what's occurring in your brain does not automatically um, – describe the reality. You know what I mean? Like the brain could be functioning as a interactive mechanism. It could be functioning in response to something, right? And so in general, the reductionism that's going on in these articles of reducing it to neuroscience factors and, and chemical factors, um, in general, it's a fallacious uh, philosophical factor. However, um, this would be one of the cases where I have to begrudgingly agree with the materialists' assumptions and say, however, in this case, it does seem to explain a lot of the, you know, factors of experience that I've experienced, what other people say. Um, there's, it's very difficult to believe that there's this mass uh, supernatural thing occurring, you know, throughout all cultures and time and such. Um, I find that very difficult to believe myself. So in this sense, I would agree, tend to agree with the general assumptions that there are natural explanations for these phenomenon. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, that, I mean, two important things out of what you just said. I mean, on the one hand, it, it is kind of, it, it does seem kind of odd and a little, oh, I don't know. I guess I'll use a word uh, that might be a little inflammatory, a little silly to think that if, if this is a supernatural thing that, that, the demons have to follow a template. <laughs> like, like, are they going to be graded, you know, after, after harassing? So oh, you didn't do it right. You know, yeah. you missed this element, you know, bad demon or whatever, incompetent <laughs> demon. You know, so on, on the one hand, it, it is kind of, you know, at, at least to my thinking, a little bit odd that, that you would have that as an explanation when there's such consistency across cultures and time, you know, I, I, like yeah. why would that be if we're dealing with intelligent supernatural beings, they can do what they want. You know, why, why do they have to follow a template? So that's, that's one thing. And the reductionist thing though, I think is really important because, you know, to, to put it in really simplistic terms, if your model is materialism, that, that consciousness is a thing produced by the brain and nothing more versus some sort of filter. Well, your brain is essential for consciousness to be experienced and detected and operate kind of like a radio, you know, capturing the radio waves. It doesn't, I like the radio model because it doesn't produce the radio waves, but they're undetectable without it. So if, if your brain is instead a thing that filters consciousness or makes consciousness known that's a totally different model, and, it, and consciousness is separate from the brain. Depending on, on which one of those perspectives you follow, uh, you're going to parse the data of something like sleep paralysis quite differently. And you can tell, you're right, as you read through the articles, it is a very reductionist model. It, it's only entertaining um, these not just these things, but but you, it, it comes out in a few places. Consciousness in general is is just a a product or a byproduct of this thing we call the brain. So if you're operating from that perspective from the get go, you're going to be sort of conditioned to not entertain 
any other possibility or even if it's not a cause and effect any other like like nat was saying supernatural exploitation or some sort of involvement even peripherally that that's just not going to be on your radar because you've adopted a materialist model whereas someone who doesn't you know could these other things could be part of the picture but again not a cause and effect yeah. uh, sort of thing that anybody else what are your feelings and push back or you got the, one of the a different direction this is Dio. One of the Shane articles, the one in the Consciousness and Cognition Journal, uh, hints at this worldview assumption coming into play. Um, and I'll just read a couple sentences from it. Um, Shane wrote uh, that the, the major function of the central nervous system activity is a generation of coherence and meaning. So, like, your brain will take its input and generate a narrative. And that, actually, that kind of reminded me of an article we read we read for the EVP, when uh, which also talked about um, dream dream theory, where your your brain you know will just try to put together a narrative based on the input around you, and that narrative may or may not be um, accurate. Well, this article uh, Shane goes on and says, look, your your basically says. Your brain will conceive a narrative based on input of either exogenous origins, which is input from outside your body, mm -hmm. or of endogenous sources that mimic exogenous input. So, and Shane goes on to argue that uh, the causes of of sleep paralysis are a cascading effects of inside and outside. But what kind of struck me about that sentence or about that idea is um, if a spirit appears to you and well let me be more even more material if, if someone enters the room right now with a gun pointed at you your heart's going to start racing you're going to have adrenaline you're going to have a hard time breathing and you're going to have heightened senses these articles treat it like well yeah these are what's going on and and that's just what your body's doing right now mm -hmm. whether or not it, it, it kind of ignores the fact it kind of ignores that the reason your body is going through this. Now, one of the articles says, well, it's doing that because they're sleep sleeping on their back or there's something going on with a neurotransmitter being muted or it's just, you know, they're trying to go into REM sleep or coming out of REM sleep. And so at the meantime, the, the, the ears are picking up some sounds and they can't really breathe because they're laying on their back. And so therefore the brain's constructing this narrative. Well, all that might be true, or there could be a spirit in the room doing something to the person. And, so it, it's I, I'm kind of in the overlapping theory where I think a lot people have a hard time sleeping, especially transitioning from one type of sleep to another. And also, but some of the more heightened experiences, I mean, some of these people describe the situation as, as rape. That, that's just it seems inconceivable to me that your brain's picking up stuff on the inside and outside. And, you know, I watched a movie about something and I'm not sleeping well. So I'm dreaming about getting raped. I mean, that's pretty pretty horrific and these people who suggested th this article is one of shane's articles it was very clinical and then the very it almost concluded with oh by the way some of these people describe this as rape which was very unsettling <laughs> you know yeah i was like man that's kind of uh, like you want to tell that just sort of undid some of the clinical maybe maybe shane was trying to remind us that this is a significant thing but yeah you'd have to ask yourself the question or ask them the question why why would the brain process this set of uh, stimuli as rape? In, in other words, why why would the brain go that direction as opposed to something that a little more, a little less violent or a little more innocuous? You know, I, why why would why would that be the message your brain is firing off in your head? Right. Uh, you know, it it does seem like kind of an uh, you know uh, an exaggerated brain response or you know overkill or something like that that. It it just it's it's way over the top for what you would think you know brain your brain ought to be you know doing or, or something like that. So yeah, that again, if you're if you're if you're a researcher or if you're a person you know who who may or may not have experienced this, if you believe that that again consciousness is not inex, you know inextricably tied to the material. And not just a, not just a thing that that this material organ produces. If it if it's actually independent, well then, it it being external 
again, to what's going on inside of your head. That's on the table. You, know, it, you may not be able to know, well, is it a part here in this case or, or what role or, you know, you, you, you may not be able to parse that at all. But it's still on the table because of, of a non-materialist worldview. Um, and, that, and that might account, again, for something that sets off a fright mechanism, you know, the whole, you know, fight or flight, you know, kind of thing that response inside your head and you can see where that something, you know, strange happening to your foreign, um, that might, you know, get processed by your brain as something real frightening and violent or whatever. I mean, it, to, to me, I, I, again, I, I don't think, I don't really hear any disagreement, you know, among us that, that there's, there's some point of overlap here. Nat used the word exploitation, um, mm. you know, which, you know, is a word that involves intent. But again, if, if, if you're talking about, you know, consciousness or conscious beings that, uh, you know, are part of this, this thing we call the conscious world, it's not just a, a product of our brain, then you, you can use terms like that, uh, even though, you know, that, that involves volition, you know, on, on the part of whatever entity, you know, would, would be in discussion. So, I, I mean, I the articles to me, I, I want to hit... Um, Trey, you know, yeah, but I just want to throw this out. The the articles to me, and I think we've, we've all sort of hinted at it. If you read through these things, it it's pretty clear that you know clinical studies have established that this happens to people, you know, in REM stage, either either you know going in or coming out, and it, it, it's also pretty clear that there's a, at least a preponderance of people who experience this have had disrupted sleep patterns or they're under stress or something like that. That would of course disrupt sleep patterns. In my case, that that's exactly true. Uh, one you know, was in college and I, you know, worked, but I had a, a night job and, a, and an early morning job. So I, I wasn't getting a whole lot of sleep. The other, the second instance was when I worked third shift in graduate school. So your sleep patterns are always screwed up. Um, so that, that that makes a lot of sense to me, or at least I I fit the profile really really well uh, in in those situations. So I, again, I, I would say yeah, that's been established. And then the the one article I'm trying to remember which one it was, I think it was the uh, the Brooks article, yeah, the one about transmitter and receptor mechanisms, uh, where they would you know go into you know they use the the mice or the rats and and they would you know they were able to, you know, mimic the paralysis, you know, very precisely and correlate that with, you know, areas of the brain and brain function and all this sort of stuff. I mean, you, you could, you know, they, they made a really good case, uh, for, we know how this works. We even know where it works in the brain. And we, and we know, you know, biochemically, what you need to turn off and turn on again in simplistic language and how that would work in terms of brain chemistry and, and biology. Now what they didn't know is, is what exactly how the brain triggers all that. Um, you know, how, how it does its own shutting off and shutting on, you know, that sort of thing. So they, they could, re, they could isolate it really well uh, to brain chemistry, brain region, REM sleep, all this stuff. And so I would agree with that, that, that that's pretty compelling. Uh, if that wasn't the case, you, you should not have those those kind of precise results. But there, there's still this element of we don't exactly know how the brain sort of tells itself what to do, you know, and, you know, what what spigots to turn on and what, which other ones to, to shut off. Hey, Mike, but they can do that. Yeah. Can I ask a question? This is very relevant to what you're talking about. And uh, that article you were referring to, the Brooks article, is heavily, you know, a lot of medical language. It's hard, hard to follow. But did I was under the impression that 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 they were their studies were drug induced, mm -hmm. which which yeah. means uh, isn't wouldn't there be a qualification on the fact that these are all artificially drug induced states that they were able to achieve, but that doesn't necessarily make it natural. You know what I'm saying? It it, it kind of yeah, makes that, me question. That was the disconnect because they're they're using drugs, um, you know that, and they're not using like artificial drugs. Hey, what will LSD do here? I mean, yeah, yeah. They're, they're using chemical components. You know, again, I'm not a scientist, so I'm, my words are probably vocabulary is probably going to you know be imprecise here. But 
stuff that actually is found in the brain and, and, you know, operates in this or that region or whatever. So they're, they're using that stuff to produce, you know, the, the results that would, would mime, you know, sleep paralysis, but, but you're right. They don't know what the mechanism was for turning that stuff on or off. And so you could ask, well, okay, now you've reproduced it, but are you sure that this precise set of chemicals is what is producing this, Mm -hmm. that that the brain is actually using the stuff that you decided to use, even though obviously it could, because that's where we got the stuff from the brain. So yeah, I I think that, that, that's a, that's a legitimate question. It's a, it's, it's a loop. It's an open end uh, in their work and also why the brain would decide to do that. I mean, they don't, they don't necessarily have a, a terribly precise answer for that either. I had two thoughts in reading that article. I jotted one of them down right next to it. I, f- I felt bad for these rats. Uh, <laughs> for one, I mean, I kept thinking I knew of the somebody was going to somebody was going to bring that up, and well, it, but it, it told you what, like when they when they decapitated the rats. Well, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm actually looking at the page now. I just flipped over to it. It says under deep anesthesia, and then they have <laughs> yeah. the chemical names and the milligrams. <laughs> Rats were decapitated, brains removed, and placed in chilled four percent pata formaldehyde. And, you know, <laughs> it's like they're so precise, you know, to, yeah. to, to give you the exact conditions, you know, so that so that you know the rats didn't suffer. But nevertheless, hey, they they're dead, you know. I, they gave them terrible nightmares. I kept thinking of the secrets of Nim, you know, like no wonder the rats were mad. <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy! But, but the other thing I thought of, and it, it was not specifically addressed in any of these articles, and maybe we can address this topic in a future episode, was um, what basically the pineal gland is sort of famous in the paranormal community for being some sort of spiritual something or other, but biologically we know that it regulates it, it releases hormones that regulate sleep and also sex hormones. And so I, I was kind of curious, um, maybe we can investigate this at some point, that I wonder if there is some correlation, uh, people perceiving a spiritual component, a sexual component sometimes, and uh, certainly it's all related to sleep, if that's all related to to something going on in, in that part of the brain. It's just, it's just that's sort of just a, a weird yeah, thought we, I throw out. Well, we, I mean, I'll try to track down you know, some stuff on that. I, I'm, I'm sure... A materialist were here, he would say, "Yep, <laughs> yeah. that would be the answer to that." And again, if if you if you're if you're presuming, and again, it's not just a a a faith statement. I mean, there there are real reasons again to view the brain as this filter as opposed to this producer of consciousness. Um, if you're taking that perspective, you'd say, well, you know, maybe there is something, you know, in other words, you, you leave the door open that, that gets on the table because of, of the, the, you know, the different perspective on the whole mind body thing, um, that, you know, people have or have, or, or don't have. So, yeah, and I'll, I'll try to look, look up and see if anybody's done anything on that. Trey, we haven't heard uh, from you. What, what do you think? Yeah. I like the Shane's paper about the position and timing effects. Um, you know, laying on your back during sleep paralysis was reported to be more prevalent in the middle and the end of the sleep than at the beginning, suggesting that sleep paralysis episodes at the later times might arise from brief micro arousals during REM, possibly induced by apnea. So mm-hmm. I think maybe a lot of people are waking up mid sleep, mid REM sleep, and who knows what their brain is in the midstream dreaming or whatnot, trying to wake up to catch a breath. So that whole sensation of, of, of you know, something choking you or on your chest, you can't breathe might simply just be apnea and uh, perceived as something demonic in nature. And, and, and we even had a, a listener, uh, Eric email us about his experiences and and he, he echoed kind of what I'm thinking, and I think Nat alluded to it, that the supernatural, who's to say that the supernatural cannot can't take advantage of the situation? You know, there's probably a supernatural element here that during these complete normal human, human biological events are capitalizing on. So, uh, you know, that was making me think of that uh, a little bit. Yeah, no, I, yeah, the apnea thing, I, I thought, you know, that, that certainly, that just has to play a role you know, in, in those symptoms, especially the, the choking, the pressure, 
you know, trying to get oxygen, you know, all, all that sort of thing. So if, if everything sort of, you know, if, if the, the stars align, so to speak, where you're, you wake up during that particular, you know, stage of sleep and, and, you know, you have an ap- apnea problem, you're, you know, you're going to, you're going to have this sensation, you know, in your, in your brain, you know, could be processing that. E- even if you're conscious, let, let's say that you don't, there were like the Cox article, w- which was the one on folklore. It had a, it was a short article, but it had a lot of good cross cultural stuff in there uh, about people who, you know, wouldn't necessarily know anything, uh, you know, scientifically that could help them process whatever experience they were having. Um, you could, you could see where they could be totally conscious and unable to move and struggling, you know, to, to take a breath or, you know, they start to panic and, um, all these things could sort of combine and then be processed as this, um, you know, attack, you know, again, demonic attack, that, that sort of thing. Again, not, not to rule out, you know, the, a supernatural component or at least some sort of, you know, peripheral relationship or, you know, uh, again, I, I think we have to leave the the door open for that, but I think overwhelmingly, I, I, I was reminded of the whole alien abduction thing through this. And it's long been my position that, you know, I don't think, you know, that, that there are aliens, you know, assaulting people in their beds and whatnot. I think most of it is explained either by, you know, sleep paralysis or some other, something else, you know, going on inside the brain. But, you know, I I think you, you could have a couple, you know, instances, again, things that, that I've at least read about that just seem to be a bit beyond that uh, in terms of, of what the person relates and, and, and frankly beyond, you know, the, these articles. And so, you know, I'm willing to leave the door open for some sort of, you know, demonic, uh, you know, presence or assault or whatever word we want to use, you know, in, in some cases, but that, uh, since I brought it up, what do we think about not just the, the whole connection of this? Because one of the, I think one or two of the articles, you know, mentioned, you know, the alien abduction thing in relationship to this. The old hag, you know, thing comes up all the time uh, with this. But I think a couple of them mentioned the alien abduction syndrome. So what, what do we think in light of this? You know, this might be a bit of a curveball, and we might want to, you know, reserve it for another episode. But you know, we all know people who either I had this experience and I, you know, asked the Lord to intervene and and the experience stopped or people who, you know, recommend that in terms of a a procedural counseling, you know, technique or, you know, some sort of maybe deliverance model or or whatnot. So what what do we think about that in relationship to this, you know, what, what we read for this time? Any thoughts? Well, you know, um, we're all familiar with Chris White, and he's mm-hmm. got sort of a, a whole sub ministry dedicated to stopping sleep paralysis. Mm-hmm. And his claim is that in pretty much every case that he's encountered, he has found that calling on the name of Jesus does stop it. And then there's other people like Joe Jordan and, and, you know, they would kind of in relation to the abduction phenomenon would say that, you know, calling on Jesus to intervene will stop these experiences. And, you know, some could say that that is just maybe, um, you know, that's where we find our comfort. So calling upon the name of Jesus can maybe put us into a more relaxed state. I suppose that would be the, the, the clinical explanation for it. But Chris White will go so far as to say that he recommends even non-believers to call on the name of Jesus, and it will stop these um, experiences from happening. So that would sort of negate that. And I don't know how many actual case studies he's followed, but he tends to be a pretty level-headed guy. You know, I'm sure he's looked into this, but I was thinking, gosh, wouldn't it be interesting if one of these studies was open-minded enough to say, okay, let's try this in a handful of people in the midst of having this experience. If we, you know, um, suggest to them to specifically call upon Jesus to intervene and stop the experience and see what would happen. Mm -hmm. That that's kind of what was going through my mind. Um, 
because I, even during the course of this conversation, I'm fluctuating back and forth because I know in just my own research, when I did that show on spectrophilia, I, there were so many cases and, and Doug Overmeyer alluded to this where people go so far as to consider it to be rape. And of course you could take that into, even into the alien abduction thing where people mm-hmm. think that they've been, you know, impregnated by aliens or whatever. Um, that seems like such an intense thing to discount as, as just, you know, hallucination. But then at the same time, I'm looking at this Cox article, the, the, the folklore article, there's instances like they cite, um, this community of, um, uh, Hmong men, uh, in, um, East Asia, where they like had this unusually high percentage of men who were actually dying in their sleep, very similar experiences to the classic um, sleep paralysis thing where there was, you know, inability to breathe and, um, and all of that. But it was actually they were dying. Mm -hmm. And the the article says that even now the Centers for Disease Control statement holds that there's no actual the, – the, the cause of death is unknown. Like they can't completely explain it, but it tracks with sleep paralysis. So to me that would indicate that, gosh, it must be able to get pretty darn intense if you can actually die from yeah, you, it. Like, like dying from fright, you know, yes. that, that sort of thing, yeah. Yeah, so that's where I keep fluctuating back and forth because my 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 supernatural worldview wants to say, well, if it's that intense, then obviously there's this other explanation. But yet there are plenty of studies and, and anecdotes that show that this strictly physical response is enough to actually kill you. And it does say that, you know, stress was a catalyst probably in this particular community. Um so I can see it. I can see it relating to the abduction phenomenon. I can see it related to the demonic attack phenomenon. I can see it relating to all of these things in a, in a, in just the the very clinical way that they describe sleep paralysis. But I would just be so interested to see a study where they included that calling on the name of Jesus. They probably never would, <laughs> but it would be so interesting to see if that's, if that actually yielded results like Chris mm-hmm. claims that it does. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I know Chris, you know, probably not as, as well as some of you, but, um, and this isn't, this isn't in any way a comment to impugn, you know, Chris's integrity because I think he ha- he's has high integrity, but I'm a little dubious you know, when it, when it comes to, to this sort of thing, because there hasn't been uh, a large sample study. Yeah. And I'm also wary of it uh, because all you need is one or two to falsify it. You know, so what, what happens if we do the study and let's just say it's all Christians, you know, let, let's just exclude the, the unbeliever. And, you know, we, we, you know, convince people, look, we're going to, you know, we're going to just follow you, you know, for X number of months or years. I mean, you get people who uh, say they experienced this with some regularity. And, you know, we want you to try to stop this with the name of Jesus. And then you, you tell us what happened. And, you know, assuming everybody's going to be honest and whatnot. Well, so what happens if a, if you get one or two believers that say, well, I, I did that and it just didn't work, mm. came back. Well, the reason I'm wary of it is is to me that that takes us into the whole faith healing thing. Then mm-hmm. the problem is you. Yeah. There must be something wrong with you because you didn't get this result over here. Yeah, your faith and, is lacking. Right. Your faith is lacking. Maybe you have some secret sin. It, it becomes really, and again, I'm not saying a researcher would intentionally do this, but, but e- even if they were passive and, and they said things like that, in the person's mind, they, they can be manipulated by that sort of response uh, in, in a bad way, you know, that, that it's going to it's going to really damage, you know, their, their walk with the Lord or their Christian life or, or their doctrine or whatever. So I, I'm really wary of, of this kind of approach because it is falsifiable. And, and I don't, I don't really care so much that it's falsifiable because I want to know if it's A or B. I mean, I, that's just, that's me. I, I, I just want to know if it's A or B. Yeah. You but, could have but, Christians but who would 
you know, my, my concern is the effect it has on, on other people again in, in a, in a negative way. Go ahead. Yeah. You could, you could have Christians who don't even really believe that much in the supernatural realm and say, well, I don't think it's going to work. So that's just, again, that's, that's priming. That's, that's a perfect example of priming the audience. You know, um, I, I've had people, I've had, I shouldn't say people, I haven't had very many, but I had a, a few people have written into the website, my, my ministry with these things. And I sent some prayers and one person replied back that, Hey, it worked. And I'm an atheist. I don't know what to do with my belief system. Basically was, was her reply. I don't know what to do with that. Theologically. I, I think I'd be curious if someone said, well, pray in the name of Buddha and see if the same thing happened. I mean, is yeah. it just a part mm -hmm. of, is it just organizing your thought pattern or is it really a supernatural thing? Or is it some experiencing a physical healing? Like maybe it's not a supernatural presence, but it's a, it's a physical thing going on. So God releases healing. I, I don't know. It's hard to, it's hard to do scientific studies on, on yeah, and, I, and, I, and I would, I would even be a, again a little, a little more blunt. I think it's, I think it's theologically dangerous. In other words, not dangerous to good theology, but it's dangerous to, to people in the way they, yeah. they think theologically. Because in that case, I mean, we, we, we'd all, especially if you're a non-materialist, you're gonna, you're gonna say that there's something to, um, you know. Well, even if you are a materialist, let's, let's just uh, – lots of materialists would say that there's something to mind over matter. That in other words, the way, what, what, the way your brain is operating and thinking and whatnot has an effect on your body you know, for good or ill. I mean th there are very few people who are going to deny you know, that sort of thing. Well, if that's the case, then, well, hey, maybe you know, invoking the name of Buddha or Jesus or something else is going to have a psychosomatic effect that will help, you know, take away or, or ameliorate this uh, sleep paralysis problem. I mean, so, so then what if it works for them? You know, it, again, it, it, it just, it, it's sort of taking a, a kind of nebulous cause and effect kind of relationship. Like what is, we know what the effect is, but what really is the cause, you know, uh, it's taking that and then sort of superimposing it on, theological thought, which again, I'm very wary of that in, in really both directions. And so I, I would be one who would challenge, um, you know, Chris and, and, and Joe in, in a good way. Again, I'm not, I'm not mm -hmm. doubting that, that this actually does, you know, help people and, and, and people, you know, have, have the outcome that they want, but I want to see a large sample study. I, 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 you know, and I want to see it in all these different directions, like with Buddha and all this other stuff, because once you do that, and again, you have to assume, like any study, that your people are being honest. Once you do that, it, it is a falsifiable thing. Well, then, what do you do? You know, so I'd yeah, I'd like to see it done, but it I, I'm, I'm wary of, the, of it. It makes me think of the problem too of using like this is a little off topic, but like using near death experiences to prove uh, heaven, mm -hmm. because once again, there's probably just as many people out there who have NDEs where they go to nirvana or they encounter buddha or you know all of these different kinds of things so then does that disprove heaven yeah, you know i think that's a really good example because you look at at ndes and there's there's two there's two things you can take from that oh this tells us exactly what heaven is like or well, there are things about these things that really strongly suggest a disconnect of consciousness from the brain. Th those are two related but quite different, you know, assertions, different ideas. One is, is going to be really theologically problematic because you're not always going to have the same description and, and you're going to, it's going to be colored by various things that are floating around in your head from religious content. But the other is theologically helpful because – you know, it, it, it sort of validates a non-materialist approach just more generally, you know. So, yeah, yeah I think that's a good example that, that you, could, you could do the same kind of parsing with this. And if we're too categorical about what we say is happening when a person does this or that to stop sleep paralysis, that's – that's pretty edgy. I mean, again, that, that, that's something that I'm very wary of because of the effect it'll have on people and what, what opponents of, of good theology might do with it. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm just suspicious of that. I, 
the, the whole uh, enterprise, even if it if it could be done, I, I think we'd, we'd find out that we really can't say the things that we're saying uh, about stopping sleep paralysis if we actually did that kind of research. I wanted to put something out there, it's a little bit controversial, sort of related to this. That, that it came to mind reading the sub- article about uh, the position where uh, Shane made the ar- made the argument, or I thought compellingly defended the position that most people who have sleep paralysis are in the supine position and in sort of piggybacking off Nat's earlier thought that maybe sometimes spirits um, exploit um, these situations for whatever purpose, terror or whatever. Uh, and this is, this is, this is going to be sort of a hyper um, spiritual interpretation of this. So it's just a, with that assumption, what is it about the supine position that, that, is conducive to a spirit maybe attacking somebody. And I couldn't help but to think that uh, about yoga and some people, and I'm all over the place on yoga, I, so don't take this as a, a position statement. It's just, I'm just throwing it out there. It's just spaghetti I'm throwing on the wall, and if it sticks, it sticks. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But some people consider yoga, you know, it's, it was from the e- Eastern religions and had a spiritual component. Um, some people today even say, even argue that the positions that people do when they do yoga are conducive to spiritual influence. Now, other people completely discount that, but you know, I, I'm not taking a position. But I just kind of wonder: is that you know, maybe there's a connection? Maybe I don't know. Maybe not. But it came to mind when I was, I was reading the articles. If that makes any sense at all, <laughs> I have so many disclaimers in there. I'm not sure I said anything. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't know how a whole lot about yoga i i've never uh, attempted it nor will i um <laughs> anybody, anybody have any thoughts about you know body position I mean, if that's a big deal in yoga anybody have any experience researching that or doing it that sounds like a no <laughs> <laughs> maybe we should that should be uh the topic of one of the next uh shows uh, we, well, you know, we can give you homework, Brian. <laughs> just, we'll see if those you, dreams and those movies all... You complete. do that for a couple of months and then tell us about it. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, to, to sort of draw this, you know, to a, a close, I, again, I think, I think we're all sort of on the same page that, you know, because of the the weaknesses or the inadequacies are really the the unsatisfactory nature of a materialist view of of everything um that you know we're all willing to leave the door open to some sort of uh supernatural you know some involvement some element uh in in, in maybe you know some instances of sleep paralysis again very small is the sense i get from the discussion and, and that would that would be my assessment as well i don't think there's any necessary connection here um to the supernatural world and sleep paralysis um because i i do think even though they they don't necessarily know why the brain does what it does when you know it, they don't have all of the uh the answers as to what triggers this uh, the articles, to me, you know, do satisfactorily demonstrate that this is a this is an issue of brain activity, you know, brain chemistry, even you know, body position to some extent, especially if there's an apnea uh, element to it. Um, I don't I don't really find uh, any major holes, you know, in in that approach. You know, even though you know they're they're going to admit that we don't know exactly, you know, how how the brain decides to do X, Y, or Z, but they can, you know, it can be replicated. It can be observed in conjunction with, with REM sleep, uh, in, in a clinical setting. And, and to me, that, that sounds pretty persuasive. So anybody want to add anything to that or detract from it? Yeah. I've just been thinking the whole time that you've kind of got, when we're doing a show on sleep, um, and we haven't been talking much about the sleep part of this, just the paralysis part of it. And it seems to me like the kind of the three main articles, the clinical articles are dealing with the paralysis part. So they can test that and they can, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, you can do all those kinds of scientific things with it. But you can't really do that with the idea of sleep. It's more, it's more metaphysical than that. 
I think Brian was kind of getting at this a little bit earlier. When you read about the the Lilith and the Hag and all the kind of old ways that people thought about this, they were dealing with it more, I think, from the sleep part than they were from the paralysis part. And so they're trying to explain the paralysis because they have this view of what sleep is that's very different than what a materialist view of sleep is. What uh, get into that a little bit? I mean, do you th- do you think do you think they did that because they don't know? Um, they don't know the biological mechanisms behind sleep or, I just think there's something mysterious about what sleeping even is. I mean, we can talk about it in physical kinds of ways, I guess. Obviously you, you lay down, your, your eyes start moving around, you know, brain chemicals start kicking off and stuff. But, but what is sleep really? And why do we need sleep? And why is this something God has given to us? And, Another thing that came to me, to I was thinking of, is why, why is it that so many times in Scripture, God is coming to people as they're dreaming and sleeping? And it's not all the time. Sometimes it's mm-hmm. in the middle of the day, you know, but oftentimes you got the night visions and those kinds of things. I just think that there's something about sleep itself that scientism can't fully explain. And it's not capable of doing it because I, I don't think that it's a purely physical activity. Yeah, I mean, it, well, it, it does have to do with, you know, obviously it's related to consciousness. And again, if if your brain is just this filter for consciousness and, and consciousness is this disembodied thing, then, you know, it would make, you know, sense, you know, to to have consciousness interact with a, you know, the spiritual world, the disembodied world and vice versa. So, yeah, I think, again, it, it's really about that that either or, you know, proposition, you know, either the brain produces all this stuff and that's the materialist view or the brain is actually a, a, a filter uh, to, to sense and participate and, you know, interact with a consciousness and a conscious world that is separate, you know, from this, this body organ, again, our brain. So if you're, if you're, at, if you're at number two, then all, then what you just described, you know, is, is a, uh, is a valid idea. There has to be something more to this than purely, you know, pure biology, pure, pure brain. And it's, ca- not chemistry. The, it's not the fault of the, um, of the three articles that are dealing with it from a medical point of view. It's just that that's, that's what they're limited to. They can't really right. go any deeper than that. Right. And they're probably not even either inclined or even kind of the, the, the question would not occur, you know, <laughs> Uh, to to even raise an, an investigator or, or or ask you know try to you know factor into the discussion. Yeah, so, I yeah, think I, the, I, the, the ancient mindset w- did not separate supernatural from natural like like we're trying to do mm-hmm. um, in sort of a post enlightenment era. I, I've been thinking, of course, we're approaching Christmas, and I've been thinking about you know the, the Christmas story and and like when the angel appeared to Mary with, with news that she was favored. It didn't it really phase her that an angel appeared to her. It was that she was favored. I mean, the favored part was like, oh no, what does that mean? But the angel appearing was not apparently didn't wasn't as shocking. And I, I think it's because she just, you know, okay, it, it's like that's because angels are supernatural and natural, just like the sun is supernatural and natural, in in that ancient perspective. And so, well, I kept. Another sort of random thought – I have random thoughts reading these articles um, – was uh, something that Tolkien said. I think he was talking about myth, but he, he sort of compared it to like when you drink – when you eat soup and you enjoy the soup, don't get caught up with where the soup came from. Like, you know, don't look at the bones that's – you know, how you you, you seep mm-hmm. the soup out of because that kind of ruins – it kind of ruins it. Well, these guys in these articles are certainly trying to uh, – that's a scientific – process for biology trying to right. narrow down to which neurons are firing and uh it, it just seems so it is it's very clinical and and the ultimate in the one article i mentioned earlier concluded with you know just how horrifying these these are just to kind of remind us that yeah we're looking at the bones that produce the soup but keep in mind the soup is pretty horrific in this case <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah or or again the the, the old sausage you know how sausage yeah. gets made, you know, that, that's it. yeah, no, oh. it's the same idea. Yeah. <laughs> well, this was a good, uh, a good discussion. I, I'm not quite sure where, what we want to do next. Again, I have a list of possibilities, but if you want to, y'all want to let me know, um, 
you have a, a vote in favor of something, by all means, do that. Uh, otherwise, I'll I'll pick one out of the hat again uh, to to focus on. So thanks uh, for everybody that uh, showed up. Most everybody, I, I know, you know, Judd uh, wasn't able to make it. He has a a bit of a health issue, uh, not not serious, but something that uh, was debilitating that he couldn't be here. But uh, thanks to everybody else for taking the time. And uh, Nat, thank those two who rescued you from the snow. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> so, pass on our thanks. <laughs> <laughs> who dug you out of the car or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and you yeah, have a have a good rest of the afternoon, you know, dealing with uh, dealing with the snow. I don't miss that at all. Yes, I. As soon as I'm done here, I have to go out and get Sweet. the car ready to head out again. So that's awesome. <laughs> uh, oh boy. Well, yeah. Be warmed and filled. That's all I can say. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Thanks. Have a good afternoon. Talk, Talk to you later, guys. <laughs>